Well, good morning. Good morning to those. Are we on my on there? Good morning to those that are watching at home online. Glad you guys could join us this morning to to worship. Um, if you're new with us, we've been in a series. We've been studying the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, and it's been kind of a just a crazy journey as we've been diving in, just learning about Jonah. And so today we're actually going to be, it's kind of sad, we're going to be wrapping the book of Jonah up. I mean, it's only four chapters, but it's taken us six weeks to get through four chapters, right? Because I'm a little slow, all right? But so we're going we're gonna actually going to get through this this book today, the rest of it. We've only got two verses now. We got, we got the whole rest of Jonah chapter 4. And this past week, I was just kind of reflecting on the story of Jonah as I was working on my, my deck on the back of my house. Um, some of you know I've been working on my deck last year. I, um, I saw there was a couple boards that were kind of not looking too good. And, and so I went to Lowe's and I bought six deck boards, 12-foot deck boards, thinking that it was just going to be a simple little fix, pull up a couple deck boards and put new ones down. And as some of you probably heard this, so I ended up pulling up those deck boards last year only to find that underneath the surface was a bunch of black rot on my joists. And as I began to pull up more deck boards, more than half of this deck, the joists, were covered with black rot. Right? Now, now here's the good thing about it, the whole thing, because Brian Pinnock, if he's in back here, he helped me build this deck. He did most of the work. I sat and watched. But, but he helped me build the deck. And, and this deck is built solid. I mean, it is a solid foundation. All right? And, and the foundation beams are still intact, and they are as solid as solid can be. We, we overbuilt that thing. You could drive a tank on that thing. But the joists that are sitting on it, where the deck boards sit on, they begin to rot out. Now, the original deck on the back of the house is still there. It's over 15 years old, and it's solid, but these joists started to ride out. And I was thinking about it when I was thinking about Jonah, because it's really kind of what's going on in Jonah's life. Just kind of doing a quick recap. Jonah is a man of God. The, word of the, Jonah, the whole book of Jonah starts with the word of the Lord coming to Jonah. God is speaking to him. God is calling him. He wants Jonah to go to this, this, their enemies, this wicked nation, um, the Assyrians, to this great city, the greatest city in the world during this time, the city of Nineveh. And Jonah is this reluctant prophet, and he goes, no, I am not going. And as I talked about in this series, these Assyrians were just ruthless in the way that they, they treated people. They would just ruthlessly murder people. And so Jonah, they're, they're the enemies to his people, and there's probably someone in a close proximity to him that they, they murdered. And so he is not going to preach repentance to these people, and he does just the exact opposite, and he's running away. And as we begin to learn, as we've gone through this story, that underneath the surface, here's this man of God, but underneath the surface in Jonah's life is black rot that is decaying and eating away at him. And God, as we've seen in this story, God is relentlessly pursuing Jonah. Because Jonah, or God cares more about what's going on in Jonah's life, and he cares more about just what's on the surface, but he cares about what's underneath and the black rot that is eating Jonah up on the inside. Right? So just do a quick recap here. So, so the, you know, Jonah gets on the ship. He's setting sail to the farthest city away in the known world that's on the coast of Spain, going in a complete opposite direction. And God says, nope, you're not going to get away. Sends a storm, stops him. Then Jonah has to be thrown overboard. He's what? Swallowed by what? A great fish. Right? So this whole thing takes place, and then God, you know, sends, tells the fish to vomit him up onto the shore, and then he goes and he preaches repentance to these Ninevites, and they are humbling themselves, and they're repenting before God. And now Jonah, we're picking up in chapter 4, Jonah is now having a what? A pity party. He's now having a pity party, and this is what we're going to be picking up. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. So last week was when things don't go your way, right? Jonah's having his little hissy fit. Things aren't going his way, and he's really mad. Remember last week, and he's mad at who? He's mad at God. He's like, God, I, how dare you be the way you are? How dare you be so good and so gracious to, to, to care for these, these, these Ninevites that are so wicked? I want you to just punish them for what they've done. And so Jonah is just dealing with this black rot that's eating away at him. And God, as we're going to see in the end of this, God is after his heart and pursuing him. So today we're going to wrap up chapter 4. Today we're going to be looking at trusting God when things don't go as planned. Because we all know there's a lot of things in life that don't go as planned, right? 
And it's often difficult to trust God when things go awry. We're always trying to figure it out. Say, why is this happening? And we don't always understand, right? And we're always trying to figure it out. So this is going to be looking at here, just diving in here. The first thing I want to look at when it comes to trusting God, we're going to learn in, as we wrap up Jonah, first thing number one is that God can see things that we can't. You see, in the surface, when I was first looking at my, my deck, everything looked okay, except it was just a little bit of, you know, softness on these boards. I thought, hey, this isn't that bad. I'm just going to go buy six boards. Literally, I did. I bought six boards, and now I've been on this major project now, my second year, and it's just, it's just a mess. And I've had to replace all these, all these joices and everything else. It's just been a long, drawn-out process because God's after something much bigger than just replacing a couple of things on the surface and making us look good on the inside. God is after transforming us on the inside, and that's what he's after in Jonah. But the thing we have to understand is that God can see things that we cannot see. All right, so let's pick up where we left last week in verse 4. All right, so, so Jonah is grumbling, and he's complaining to God, saying, I knew you were like that. And then so the Lord replies back to Jonah. Remember I talked about last week, God oftentimes throughout Scripture asks probing questions, right? Remember that? We saw that in the book of Genesis, the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned. God then said, hey, where are you? Like God didn't know where they were, right? He was after their, after their heart. You know, it's like, so did you do this? Did you do that? And so we see this throughout Scripture. Even Jesus asked the disciples questions. So the Lord is probing Jonah. He's after his heart. And so, so the Lord replies to him. He said, is it right for you to be angry about this? Now, basically what's going on here is God's just, he's, he's telling Jonah, just, just, just pause for a moment. In the midst of your stewing, Jonah, he's saying, Jonah, what's really the right thing to do in this situation? Yes, these people are sinful and wicked. But what's really the right thing to do? I know what's going on in your heart. And I know you want to see them hurt from the way that you hurt. But what's really the right thing to do? Do you really have a right to be angry about this? And basically God is asking Jonah, Do you know things that I don't know? Can you see things that I can't see? Jonah, is it not obvious that I know what's going on with these wicked Assyrians in the city of Nineveh? Is there something that you know that I don't know, something you see that I can't see? You see, God sees the past, present, and the future all at once. He is not confined by time. And God's heart is for these Assyrians, these people in this this city. So I want to jump to the book of Jonah or Job because we see this similar kind of thing taking place in the story of Job. All right, God asked, often asks these probing questions. And, and so Job is just kind of this crazy story because God allows Satan to go and, and just harass. And, to, and just Job loses everything in a day. And Job, throughout the story, the main thing about Job, Job never lost his integrity. All right? Even though his wife's saying, come on, just curse God and get it over with, die. Job never, never surrendered his integrity. But he did begin to start questioning God. And he's asking these questions. So the God responds. It's similar to what God is doing to Jonah. God starts asking Job some questions. And so I want to pick up in Job chapter 38. This is what God asks Job. And I believe that God asks us these same things. When things are not going as planned and we're trying to figure all these things out, this is what God asks Job. He says, Job, he says, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? I love this verse 3. It says, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Now, we see this. Like I said last week, God is always after our hearts. And if we really pause enough and really listen, God is always probing our hearts. He's after much more than just the superficial facade and masks that we're all wearing right now, right? God is after what's underneath in our heart. So God's asking these questions. He says, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Now here's the the kicker, verse 4. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Come on, Joe, where were you? Do you know something I don't know? Can you see something that I can't see? Where were you when I called all this that you see into existence? And see, God can see things that we can't see. And he knows things that we don't know. And so many times when, when our plans go awry, we're always scrambling, trying to figure out, saying, God, what's going on here? For Jonah, Jonah was very frustrated with God because plans were not going as he hoped they would. So let me just kind of give you a bullet point here. When things don't go as 
I planned. I must remember that God is God and I am not. It's just a good point to remember as we're kind of in this closing. This is what God is after in Jonah. He says, look, Jonah, I am God and you're not. And there's things that I can see that you can't see. There's things that I know that you don't know. But you got to trust me because I am the Lord God Almighty, the creator of everything. So we see in the book of Ecclesiastes, I want to jump to another passage in the Old Testament. This is what Solomon writes when it comes to this desire to trust him and to try to figure everything out. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon wrote this. said, God has given them a desire, referring to mankind. He's giving us this desire to know the future, right? I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could just know what's going to happen later today? Right? We studied the book of James last year, and James says, look, you got plans, you make all these plans, but who are you to say it's going to happen, right? And so it would be great if we knew the future, because it would just change a lot of things, right? It would change how we would, we would just do so much of life. But he says, he puts us in mankind, we're always wanting to know the future. He does everything, this is God, God does everything just right and on time, but people can never completely understand what he is doing. That's just a good biblical principle for us to always remember. We will never completely understand on this side of eternity everything that God is doing, everything that God knows. We have to learn to trust him. And for for Jonah, it's like, this doesn't even make sense. This doesn't even make sense. He's still stewing in his anger. This doesn't even make any sense. This is how the Apostle Paul addresses it as he writes to this church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, here's the deal, guys. I know that you're, you're worked up over all these things that are going on in the world around you, but he says, here's the deal. We don't see things, we don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. Now what Paul's referring to is in that day, when we go to be with our Savior in eternity, then it'll all make sense. But now we're limited. We only see in part. And I've says we only see in part. We only know in part. But then, when we are with Christ, it'll all make sense. And so we see this, this principle going on in, in this wrap-up of, of Jonah in the story. God is relentlessly pursuing Jonah's heart. He says, look, Jonah, you can't see what I can see. You don't know what I know. You need to trust me in this. And Jonah is still having his little pity party and sulking. Going on to verse 5. So then what does Jonah do as he's having this little debate with God? It says, Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. So this is what I was sharing last week. This is where he's having his pity party. He goes out and he makes this little makeshift shelter and he sits down and he's just sitting back there just waiting for the show to happen. Man, I'm just banking that God's going to listen to me and he's going to wipe them off the face of the planet. And so he just makes this little makeshift shelter And he's just waiting for the show to happen, this big showdown, just waiting for God just to blow them off the planet. That's where Jonah's heart is, this black rot that's just eating away at him. And God is probing his heart. God is relentlessly pursuing him. Which brings us to the second thing that we learn, this key principle in this story of Jonah. Number two is this, that God gives us what we don't deserve. Right? Right? I mean, this is a man of God. This is a prophet of God. He's got a book in the Bible, (laughs) right? I mean, he's just just completely rebelling against God, being disobedient, just frustrated because God wants him to go and preach repentance, and he does after he just, God gets his heart, begins to get his heart when he's swallowed, and he's going down into the, the belly of this fish, into the depths of the ocean. He's there for three days and three nights, and then God, as he repents, God spits him out on the shore, and then he's going, and he's obeying, but he's re- really reluctantly obeying God and going to, to this great city, and now he's, he, they, they repent, and he's going out, and he's sitting you know, under this little makeshift shelter, and this is what God does while he's out there. God's asking him questions, and then we pick up verse 6 here where we see how God gives us what we don't deserve. It says, and the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. And it soon spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort. And Jonah was what? 
where did this man come from? For the first time in this story, Jonah was, he was so grateful for this plant. Now, now here's the key thing, and obviously that in this story, when he, Jonah goes and makes this little makeshift shelter, it's kind of the, the picture of the gospel is that our works are not enough. God gives us what we don't deserve. We can try all we want to make our own little makeshift shift shelter. Get the words out of my mouth. It's tricky. <laughs> Repeat that three times, right? But God says, no, it's not enough. You need the covering of grace. And so God sends this plant to grow, and this, this leaf grows and brings shade because obviously this little shelter that he makes did not fully cover him. And it says it eased his discomfort. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. For the first time, he's got a smile on his face in the midst of having his pity party. So we're going to come back to this because I want you to understand that this thing that God is arranged. So God's at work in here in his life, even when he's still sitting there, sulking in his little pity party. God extends grace to him, gives him what he doesn't deserve, and sends this leafy plant. And so just let me give you a bullet point here. God loves us even when we are grumpy. How many of you woke up grumpy this morning? I almost did, but I let her sleep in, okay? (laughs) That's such an old joke. You guys laugh at that every time. It's so bad. (laughs) So, so even when we're unlovable, the crazy thing is, is that God and his goodness and his grace, what Jonah was so frustrated with, God still loves us and extends grace towards us. Even when we desperately try in our own strength to make our own little shelter, God says, no, I'm going to extend grace and I'm going to cover your sin. I'm going to cover your self, selfish motives that's going on by my grace, that you don't deserve. This is what Paul wrote to the church in Rome, in Romans 5, verse 8. Hold on one second. It's weird that the sound was coming through that. Anyway, anyway, Romans 5, 8. It says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That is the grace of God. While we are still enemies towards God, still in our grumpy, unlovable state, God sent his son to die for us. He gives us what we don't deserve. That is the amazing heart and love and character of God. And first, one thing we see as we read this story of Jonah, as we're going through this, we just see this incredible character of God coming out. And Jonah knows the character of God. He knows the goodness of God. And that's what makes him so frustrated because inside, he just desperately wants to see these Ninevites destroyed because of the wickedness that they have done to his people over and over again. But God is relentlessly pursuing Jonah's heart. Which brings us to the third thing, number three. And we're going to break this down as we go through this. Understanding this, when things don't go as planned, not only can we, we don't see what God can see, not only do we, does God give us what we don't deserve, but the third thing is understanding that God is in control of every part of your life. Now, we really see this key thing in the story of Jonah. So I want to jump to verse 7, and I'm going to go back over some of this. Verse 7 and 8 tells us this. It says, but God also what? Arranged. We see this word number of times, this kind of language in the, in the book of Jonah. It says, but God also arranged for a worm, right? The next morning at dawn, the worm ate this plant for breakfast. The worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And then we get to verse 8. And as the sun grew hot, God also arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Right? So, so here's the deal. When it, and then it goes on. It says, it says, somebody died said, it says, death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Once again, Jonah says this, look, I'd rather die. Now, one moment, he's happy, right? God miraculously has this plant grow, and he's got this, you know, it's shading his head, and he's really happy, and it's like, man, life's great. When things are going well, God is good, right? When things aren't going well, where are you, God. Immediately, it's crazy how our heart and our mind works. We stop trusting God when things aren't going as planned. And God is extending his grace to Jonah. He gives him what he doesn't deserve. And then God is also in control. And he does what? He sends a worm to eat that plant for breakfast. (laughs) And it quickly withers away. And now Jonah, his heart is not transformed yet. He's right back into his grumpy self-pityness. 
It's so indicative. We've talked about in this series how we are so much like Jonah, right? So up and down from one moment to the next. So what I want to do is I want to take a moment, just kind of do a flyover, what God arranged in Jonah's life. Just seeing how God is in control of all the details in our life and why we need to trust him. That's one key thing that we can see here in the book and the story of Jonah's life. So we're just going to kind of go through some bullet points here. The first thing we see going back to chapter 1, verse 4, is the Lord, all right, in his sovereign power, all right, he sent a great wind on the sea. Jonah says, look, I'm out of here. I'm not going to do what you say. I'm not going to live on mission. I'm not going to go preach repentance. I'm going to get on a ship, and I'm going to go as far away from mission as I possibly can. And God intervened and sent a wind to stop that ship dead in its place. Right? And so we see that God, as he's working through these things like this, God is intervening, intervening to stop you from going too far. So there are many times in life when we're just kind of pushing the threshold, right? We're pushing the envelope, and God steps in in his sovereignty because God is relentlessly pursuing you as much as he relentlessly pursued Jonah. And he will stop us dead in our tracks, even if something blows up in our face, because God is after our hearts just as he was Jonah. So then we we see another thing. So chapter 1, another one in in chapter 1 is verse 17. It says, then what? It says, then the Lord arranged a great fish to swallow Jonah. So there's other times where God does something big to swallow you up to get you going in the right direction, right? Have you ever had something in life just really big swallow you up, things didn't go as planned, and all of a sudden you're just just completely overwhelmed, you're swallowed in this whole thing. Where do I go from here? What do I do now? Five years ago, I was swallowed in the belly of a great fish. We were in transition to plant this church. And we just felt like God was calling us to do this, but but there was just a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of anxiety around the whole thing. And we're like, God, this doesn't make any sense. It was easy to get frustrated over over circumstances that were going on. It was like, God, this doesn't make any sense. Why would why would I walk away from this cush position that I have, this cush job, you know, where where I'm making the most I ever made in my entire career? Why would I stop now to go do something else, to go do this mission that I sense that you're calling us to? Why would I do that? Why would I get out of my comfort zone, God? And God just completely had me swallowed in this whole thing, saying, "Are you willing to trust me?" Because I can see things that you can't see. I know things that you don't know. And I'm after more than a job and a position. I'm after your heart. I'm after getting rid of the black rot that's underneath the surface. So I can have your whole heart. And then accomplish my purposes through you as I accomplish them in you. Right? And that's this whole story of Jonah. This is what God is doing. And God does something big to swallow us to get us going in the direction that he wants us to go in. So we're just doing this, this flyover here. Then we see in chapter 2, then the Lord ordered this fish. They throw him, the sailors throw him into the sea, right? Then the Lord ordered. So God is arranging. He's at work. His will is at work here. The Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah on. He swallowed it. Then he spits him out onto the beach in chapter 2. Actually, that's chapter 3, isn't it? I think it's chapter 3. Maybe it's not. Yeah, that's right. That's the end of chapter 2. Sorry, it's all blur in my head. So the Lord ordered him to spit him out. So we see here that God provides the means to deliver you from deep pain and fear. So in the midst of those times where, where God's working in our hearts, then we also see the deliverance of God coming. Where Jonah, he's got Jonah's heart. Jonah is then repenting. And he just the whole chapter 2 is this incredible psalm, the psalm of Jonah. As he's actually quoting scripture Many passages from the book of Psalms. Then the next thing we see the Lord arranged, we just kind of read Jonah chapter 4, verse 6. The Lord arranged a leafy plant to comfort him. So there's many times where God will provide something new in your life to comfort you. Right? And we get all excited, right? Because we got the new and greatest phone, right? (laughs) And we're all excited. Some little thing, or we got that job, we got that, that promotion, some good thing comes along. It's like, man, God, you're so good now. Right? We get all excited about that. But then the next thing happens in verse 7. Then the Lord arranged a worm to eat the plant. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Right? We see that in the book of Job. And so we see this thing that takes place. And so then God will arrange small things to test our faith. Because it's so easy as we're, we're up and down in this life where things can just lure our hearts away from God so quickly. And God is constantly working, relentlessly pursuing us, wanting every part of our heart. 
And so he'll send little small things like a worm to test our faith. And then in verse 8, which we just read, is then the Lord arranged a hot wind to blow on Jonah. And the deal with that is sometimes God will turn up the heat, right, to get you to move out of your comfort zone, to get you moving in the direction that he wants you to move in. And so sometimes when, when the heat's being turned up, it's not a bad thing. It's when we have to pause and say, okay, God, what questions are you asking? What are you after? What's under the surface that you're after in my heart? That's what God is after for Jonah. So we see throughout this, this whole story, that God has been working, relentlessly pursuing Jonah. And that's a picture of how God pursues us. He's relentlessly pursuing our hearts. And the motive behind every one of these things that God is doing is love. And we have to remember, we can't see everything. We don't know everything. And God gives us what we don't deserve. And our God is good. And God is in control. And he's working and willing, as Romans 8.28 tells us, for our good. The motive of God's heart is always good. God can never defy his character. He is good. And he's relentlessly pursuing us as he relentlessly pursued Jonah. Now, I want to point out another thing as we're wrapping up this, this story. is the word great. All right, the word great is used 13 times in the book of Jonah. I just want to give us a couple of them, put some bullet points up here. So some of the great things, this word great, this Hebrew word is used 13 times over and over again. Now this is kind of a, a common comparing and contrasting the way that the Hebrew writers would often write. And for us, we kind of read this, you know, we would never catch it because we don't read Hebrew and we wouldn't see the, those words that are used over and over again to see the emphasis. And so we see this common in the Old Testament. There's something great compared to something small, all right? And we see Jesus kind of doing that same thing when he comes on the scene. And so just this word great, it's referenced a number of times. Right in verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2, he talks about the great city of Nineveh. This incredibly powerful city. It is the center of influence in the known world at the, at the time. All right? These, these Assyrians were the, the big powerhouse in the world. All right? And then we see in verse 4, there was a great wind. And then it says in, in verse 10, the sailors were greatly afraid. This is this emphasis. This is the word they, you know, it could have just been written, they were afraid. No, they were greatly afraid. All right? Then there's a great storm in verse 12. Then there's a great fish in verse 17. And then it says, the, in chapter 3, the people believed, and it says, from the greatest to the least. It started with the king, all right? And him stepping off the throne and repenting. And then the rest of the city followed, from the greatest to the least. And then in chapter 4, these change of plans, it greatly upset Jonah. So there's this emphasis here. Jonah is not just a little upset. He is extremely angry. And then in verse 6, then he was all of a sudden greatly happy, <laughs> Right? Anybody ever a day like that? Right? Just go from one emotional swing to the next. And then we see at the very end of this we're going to get to here is then God's compassion on this great city. So over and over again we see this emphasis. And I also want to point out the little things. And then we're going to come back and I'll show you why this is important when it comes to just trusting God and God being in control of all the details. So let's look at the small things that are mentioned throughout the book of Jonah. It starts off that Jonah bought a ticket, right? Now, as I shared that week, the first week, that God could have simply said, no, you're not even getting on a ship. You're not going anywhere. God could have stopped it right then and there. But, he, but we have this, this thing called free will, right? And God doesn't force us to do anything. And so Jonah buys this one little tiny ticket. And for him, all of a sudden, this little thing's a big deal for him, all right? And then we see there's this whole thing where there's this casting lots. You know, it's basically rolling the dice, all right, these little things that are taking place to determine the outcome. The ticket determined the outcome. The, the, the casting lots is determining the outcome. These small little things along with the big things. Then he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now we talk about the significance of that to the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. All right, but this is a small window of time that he's in the belly of the fish. All right? And then he goes to Nineveh. And what's actually interesting is that in, in, when he goes to preach, he only uses four Hebrew words. He didn't even have this eloquent message. And one of the bullet points I left out was it said he, the city was so big that he had to take three days to go around the whole city. And he's just grumbly going out and obeying God and preaching repentance with these four simple words, hardly giving him anything to go by, but they repent. 
And, and Jesus, you know, he did the same, or, or the, John the Baptist did the same thing, and Jesus did the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's like four simple words there. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? I can't count. But, but we see this throughout even the Old Testament. There's these simple little words, these simple little phrases, and God works through small things. A short little message, and then there's this small little leafy plant, and then there's a small little worm that eats the plant for breakfast. Now here's the deal. Here's why I'm pointing out all this. Because the one thing we cannot miss in the story of Jonah, this next bullet point here, is understanding that God works through both great and small things to direct our lives. He is constantly working and willing in our hearts and in our lives. And he uses both great things and the small things to get our attention. And when we are living in disobedience as Jonah was, God is constantly and relentlessly pursuing his heart. And he will work through every little detail to get us back on track. And so we see this kind of, in in this wrap-up in Jonah, this emphasis on these great things and these small things. Going on to verse 9. So that God is continually pursuing Jonah, and he's probing him with these questions. And it says, then God said to Jonah, I got another question for you, Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? All right, so one minute Jonah's angry because, because his plans didn't go as he hoped they would. God changed his mind and relented and didn't bring destruction on these people. So then God sends a plant. He's now happy, greatly happy, because he's got comfort. He's out of, the, out of the heat of the sun, you know, and then the plant dies, and now Jonah's angry again. He says, look, is it right for you to be angry about this living plant that I sent here? And Jonah just retorts right back. Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Jonah's having a rough time. He really is. And there's times in life when we, we're a lot like Jonah where we're, there's just some things we're just having a hard time shaking. He's been deeply hurt. And he is really struggling. Yet God has not given up on Jonah. And he's probing his heart. And he's after him. He's like, Jonah, do you really have a right to be angry over this plant? Which brings us to the last thing, number four. This is kind of the punchline of the entire story of Jonah, what God is after. And the key is that God wants us to focus on what is eternal. That plant was temporary. It was going to die at some point, right? It was temporary. God wants us to focus on what is eternal. And so many times in this life, how many times do we get worked up over the silliest little things, right? Right? Because one little thing don't, doesn't go the way we plan it to. I'm telling you, I, I lost, you know, so much sleep over this silly deck. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is ridiculous. This thing should have lasted a lot longer than this. Why is this thing so that I'm realizing I probably didn't, there's all these things, trying to figure it all out, right? And all I know is that I got to redo it. <laughs> and I'm working on redoing it. But I had to get rid of what was underneath all that black rot. And that's what God is after in Jonah. He says, look, Jonah, stop focusing on the temporary And in the end here, we see that God is now really pressing Jonah. Stop focusing on yourself. Stop focusing on that which is temporary. And we get into verse 10 and 11. It's kind of the close of Jonah. It says, the Lord said, Jonah, here's the deal. You feel sorry about the plant. Though you did nothing to put it there, it came quickly and died quickly. You're all worked up over this plant, but here's the deal. And here's where I want to press you on, Jonah. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Jonah, where's your heart, buddy? You're getting all worked up over all the wrong things. You're focused on the temporary And your pain is eating you up on the inside and it's keeping you focused on yourself. And I want you to trust me because I see things that you don't see. I know things that you don't know. And there's something much bigger. There's been this black rot going on in this city for a long time. And I created the Ninevites and I want to save them. And God also wants to save Jonah, rescue him from the black rot that's eating away at him. And so God presses him. And we're in the same situations we've talked about throughout this series. 120,000 was probably just counting the men. That was typically how they counted things. 
So it was probably twice that amount. And around us is more than 120,000 people who are living in spiritual darkness. And I don't know about you, but I, sometimes I get on social media and I just want to say, guys, what are you focused on? And I'm, I'm not saying just you. I'm just saying, just read all these things. Like, why are we we're so focused on the temporary? Elections are going to come and go. This pandemic's going to come and go. But every person that we set our eyes on is eternal. And they're going one place or another. We know the end of the story. And we have a Savior and a God who relentlessly died to pursue every, every person on this planet. And I firmly believe that God, as he's addressing Jonah, and he's pressing him, says, what are you focused on? And so just let me put this up here. This is kind of my summary of what God is after. He says, what do you care about most? Jonah, what do you really care about most? The temporary comforts of the world or the salvation of spiritually lost people? The whole story of Jonah is the picture of, a, of the gospel. Jonah's living in rebellion, and God relentlessly pursues him and extends grace when he didn't deserve grace. And it's the whole story of what God did for us in Christ. And there are people all around us facing a Christless eternity that desperately need us to live on mission. But it's so easy to get focused on the temporary comforts of this world. What's in my bank account? What kind of vehicle I drive, what kind of this or that, whatever it is we have, these things are all temporary, but people are eternal. And they need us to live on mission and stay focused on the mission of the kingdom. And so kind of in summary, just the last two bullet points here. What God is after, as he was in Jonah, is after us, is that God wanted Jonah to have a heart like his and live on mission. And to put it for us, is it God wants you to have a heart like his and live on mission. Don't get focused on the leafy plants, but keep your focus on our Lord and Savior who died to rescue every person that we set our eyes on. Amen? All right, let's pray.